Hello, and welcome to Amateur Bomb Museum, where admission is free to members of all races, creeds, genders, and meters. I'm your host, Victoria Brockmeyer, and this week we're going to take what will no doubt be the first of many dives together through the poetry of Emily Dickinson. Little known fact, it is medically impossible to get too much Emily Dickinson. I'm going to do a general introduction to reading Dickinson, then work with what's probably my favorite out of all her poems, one of my favorite poems of all time, Don't Put Up My Thread and Needle. When I teach Dickinson in a class, I start off by asking who's read any of her work before and who's encountering her for the first time. For the people who are new to her, I ask what their impressions are. Students will almost always volunteer that she seems kind of obsessed with death, which is certainly one of her biggest themes, and then they'll say something about how her poems all sound the same, that they remind them of nursery rhymes or that they could be song lyrics. At this point, at least a few people in the class who know what's coming will start to grin, because you can sing the majority of Emily Dickinson's nearly 1,800 poems to the tune of the Yellow Rose of Texas. I'm not even joking. Some of you two may already know this. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. It's not her entire corpus, but it's a lot of it. Definitely the majority of the poems of Dickinson's that make it into anthologies. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day. The owner passed identified and carried me away. Could I but write indefinite as doth the meadow be, And visit only where I liked and no one visit me? A narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. I dwell in possibility a fairer house than prose. There's a certain slant of light winter afternoons. and on and on. She has this form that she uses over and over again. It's four line stanzas, alternating lines with four strong beats, which we call tetrameter, with lines that have three strong beats, or trimeter lines, and with the second and fourth lines rhyming. If you read Dickinson in Mass from one of the big collected editions of her poems, you'll find that she does experiment with this basic form. In general, the easier or more straightforward her poems are, the closer she adheres to it. When she takes on more abstract ideas or deals with material that's more particular to her worldview and her individual experiences, as opposed to things that most people have probably seen or thought about, when she takes up things that are harder to put into words, then she experiments more. Unfortunately, those poems are harder to teach. So students taking survey classes never see them, and as a result, they get a much tamer Emily Dickinson than what the reality is. And most people today get poetry, if they get any at all, in classes like those. So the poems people have heard, for the most part, use this form. So, The Yellow Rose of Texas. It was published as early as 1853, that's the earliest record we have of it anyway. It started out with the tune we know as a love song for a mixed race girl who in the language of the time would have been called yellow. That would have been one of the polite terms. It eventually got associated with the Texas Revolution and to this day, people associate it with Texas and Texan businesses and events use it. But that connection is probably made up long after the fact, probably completely fictitious. It definitely was used as a marching song by the Confederate Army during the American Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865, though. Emily Dickinson wrote the vast majority of her poems during the Civil War, and while she lived in Amherst, Massachusetts, a long way from the battles themselves, certainly there's a possibility that she'd heard the song. It was circulating in American culture. However, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you too much if I suggest that Emily Dickinson probably didn't write close to 2,000 poems so they could be sung to the Yellow Rose of Texas. She is interested in sound, though, and in the specific sounds created by this stanza shape that she used. So you're not wrong if you think there might be some way of coming to her poetry through music. 
Among her many interests, Dickinson was intensely concerned with problems of Christian spirituality. How do we know God? How does God behave towards us mortals? What's the meaning of suffering? Why does it happen to good people? So, if you want to think about Emily Dickinson's poetry in terms of music, you might look to the hymnal. And when you read her then, you might listen for something more like this. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. But just ourselves and immortality, we slowly drove. He knew no haste, and I. The short lines and the rhymes, especially together, make readers today want to read Dickinson poems quickly. Our analogs to that form are nursery rhymes and advertising jingles and really bubbly pop songs. Those techniques raise different associations for Dickinson, though. She's not that far from our time, especially in terms of the thousands of years since people started writing poetry down, but it's far enough. Most of us have to keep a tight leash on our interpretive instincts to give rhymed poetry with short little lines the gravity that it would have automatically gotten 150 years ago. I'll leave the rest of Because I Could Not Stop for Death as an exercise for the listener. It's a cool poem. Look it up if you haven't encountered it before. Dickinson didn't title her poems, so we mainly refer to them by their first names. Under that convention, we call the one I want to get farther into today, Don't Put Up My Thread and Needle. She hardly published anything in her lifetime. No one even knew how much she'd written until after she died, in fact. Not even her closest family members and friends. What she did was to handwrite her poems out and sew the sheets of paper into short booklets that we call fascicles. For Don't Put Up My Thread and Needle, the fascicle pages look like this. Harvard University has put all this material up online for anyone to use for free. It's at edickinson.org. For decades, scholars have had to write grants to travel to look at Dickinson's manuscripts at the universities where they're physically held. And now, anyone can just click through them from home, edickinson.org. There aren't many poets whose work I'd encourage you to look at in their handwriting. And you have to work to get to where you can just read Dickinson's handwriting. But it's worth seeing this very distinctive physical presentation. Printed, we usually get very regular looking verses, usually marching down the center of a page with a lot of white space around them. You can see here, her handwriting swoops across the page. She fills the space from edge to edge. It's very stylized, very expansive and graceful. Nobody else writes like this. Dickinson's handwriting is a conscious act of self-preservation presentation, which she never presented to anyone as long as she was alive. In printed editions, you generally find Dickinson's poems set in regular four-line stanzas, which emphasize that meter that makes her work sound samey to my students, and maybe to you. Her versions, though, like this one, are less even. They're more organic, with words dropped down and the metrical lines broken up. This is a whole layer of variation she used that editors of printed editions have pretty much obliterated. 
You can also see a few word variants at the end of this poem that Dickinson included. Oh, and up at the top, she originally had down, which she crossed out and replaced with up. Then, toward the end, with uh, little plus signs, she's indicated alternatives for two words. Deeming, for what's in the poem is dreaming, and sighing, for sleeping. She does this with a lot of poems, leaving multiple possibilities coexisting together in a final text. You don't have to go to the manuscripts to get those, though. In 1998, an editor named R.W. Franklin released what's called a variorum edition of Dickinson's poems, which includes her notations for all these multiple possibilities. It has a lot of other improvements over the previous standard edition, too, but this was revolutionary. These alternatives that Dickinson's preserved in her versions of her poems open up all kinds of insight. If you're going to get a collected Dickinson, which you should do if you don't own one, Think about getting the Big Very Orem edition so you too can have access to those poet secrets. We'll look into what these two do for the poem. Don't put up my thread and needle. I'll begin to sew when the birds begin to whistle. Better stitches. So these were bent. My sight got crooked. When my mind is plain, I'll do seems a queen's endeavor would not blush to own. Hems too fine for ladies tracing to the sightless knot, tucks of dainty interspersion like a dotted dot. Leave my needle in the furrow where I put it down. I can make the zigzag stitches straight when I am strong. Till then, dreaming I am sewing, fetch the seam I missed closer, so I, at my sleeping, still surmise I stitch. Here's a poem that valorizes work. It's distinctly American Protestant in that, specifically sewing, women's work. We have a seamstress whose sight is going and so is her mind. She's sick. She's dying, in fact. This is one of Dickinson's many, many poems dealing with death. She herself lost a lot of people over the course of her life, beginning when she was quite young, so there's real grief fueling that focus in her writing. In this poem, we have a dying woman who wants to keep doing her work. She's looking towards spring, when the birds begin to whistle, which of course isn't just about the calendar, but also raises the idea of regeneration. Life returning after winter, birds coming back and singing, not to mention laying eggs. The speaker is placing herself into the future, thinking about it. She takes tremendous pride in her skills, too. When she's well, she says, she can so seems royalty would be happy to take credit for having made. We don't have any unified consensus on why Dickinson capitalizes all the words she does. It's very idiosyncratic. But lady, in the third stanza, definitely refers to nobility. Not only is this dying woman's work as good as what the most refined of women make, but it's so good that slightly less refined women, ladies instead of queens, can't even perceive it. You could trace a hem either by sight or by touch. So we can imagine a hem so fine it can't be seen or even felt. Check out her description in the third stanza, too. A sightless knot. Someone who is not a poet might say they'd made an invisible knot if it were very small or well hidden. Dickinson's poem goes beyond that. We know that sightless on one level means a knot that can't be seen. But literally, it also means a knot that can't see. We know from line five that the speaker's sight is going. With this description, a sightless knot, she seems to be identifying herself with the thing she's made, as though the stitches she's leaving behind are as much her body as the one that's going to go into the ground. We could say, this is an old woman's confusion. We could say that her craft predicted or foreshadowed her own state at the end of her life. That if her work was an inanimate echo of her, a kind of physical rhyme of her being out in the world, as she's getting closer to being inanimate herself, the speaker is coming to resemble the article she's going to leave behind. We could even say that the old woman's confusion reveals this truth, this identity, between maker and the made things. 
In the next stanza, I just want to point out for now the word furrow, used to refer to a crease in fabric, leave my needle in the furrow where I put it down. Might be the fold the speaker wants to sew up as a hem. Thumbtack that in your mind as important, because we're going to come back to it. I've talked about tropes, patterns of closely related images and ideas within individual poems. The last stanza of this poem uses a trope that appears not only throughout Dickinson's work, but poetry and literature in general. Sleep as a metaphor for death. It shows up in William Shakespeare and Sylvia Plath and before and after and in between. This last stanza, deploying that trope of death as sleep, raises a question. Does the poem's speaker know she's dying? If the poem stopped after its first 16 lines with the stanza before, I think we'd lean towards saying this speaker is in denial. All the way through there, she's planning for the future, for spring, for a time when she's going to be stronger, a time that's not going to come. Leave my sewing nearby. I'm going to pick it right back up when I'm better. Her attitude changes at the end, though. Now she's planning for a more immediate future of unconsciousness. Leave my sewing nearby because I'm going to go to sleep and I want to dream about doing my needlework. If Dickinson wanted her seamstress here to be ignorant or in denial, she could have left off those last four lines. But there they are, and their presence makes this poem much more complex. If the speaker's not ignorant, she knows she's dying, then her poem simultaneously affirms that reality and resists it. I'm dying, fine, but I'm not going to give up being who I am. I'm going to go to death full of pride in my labor and my skills, and pride in my ability to keep doing more. It's not me. I'm not any less than I ever have been. It's just death getting in my way. To talk about Dickinson, you have to talk about rhyme. She has incredibly fine control of form, and the way she uses rhyme is just without peer. So, a couple terms that help us categorize types of rhyme. First, masculine rhyme and feminine rhyme. Masculine rhyme rhymes on the final stressed syllable of a line. Mine, pine, shine, design, using just that last syllable of design. Feminine rhyme rhymes using multiple syllables, usually one stressed one followed by one or more unstressed ones, like motion and ocean or syllable and billable. For the most part, masculine rhyme sounds stronger, more certain, and more serious than feminine rhyme. Limericks will use feminine rhyme because it can sound pretty silly. Byron uses it a lot in his very long poem, Don Juan. Yes, Don Juan, not Don Juan, Don Juan, for the same reason. There's only a little use of feminine rhyme in Don't Put Up My Thread and Needle, but it is there. I'm mentioning it mainly to underscore that multisyllable rhymes do definitely count as rhymes. Another important way that we distinguish types of rhyme is between full rhyme and slant rhyme. Full rhyme is what you're used to hearing as rhyme, like all the examples I just gave. Identical sounds at the ends of lines. Slant rhyme uses sounds that are similar, but not identical. For example, I can't remember now who did it or what it was called, but there was a country song that was popular for a bit when I was younger that rhymed can't, paint, and think. If you give it enough twang, it still only kind of rhymes. Can't, paint, think. That's slant rhyme. After Dickinson's death, when her family members discovered her poetry and started publishing it, a lot of critics beat up on her because she uses tons of slant rhyme which they thought showed lack of education, lack of talent, lack of discipline, or all three. It took a while for the literary establishment to catch up with her. Now we have a richer understanding of what rhyme can do, and part of why the people who love Dickinson do is that she does incredibly cool things with slant rhyme. Let's go through and highlight all the rhymes in this poem. Bright pink for full rhymes because they're so strong and more muted teal for slant rhymes. Now, I try to keep the video aspect of this podcast helpful but not mandatory because I know there are a lot of audio-only podcast apps out there and a lot of listeners who use them. 
But for tracking things like patterns in a poem's end rhymes, you really need to look at the text. If you're an audio-only listener, you might take a minute and a half to find this part on YouTube when you get a chance. I said toward the beginning of this episode that the Emily Dickinson stanza rhymes on its second and fourth lines, so let's start with those. First we have so, S-O-W, and so, S-O, as full of a full rhyme as you can get. Those words are homonyms, same sounds, different words. This special case even has a special name, exact rhyme. Plain and own, that's a slant rhyme. Not and dot, full rhyme. Down and strong, slant rhyme. And mist and stitch, another slant rhyme. But wait, we're not done. Now that we're paying attention to those odd slant rhymes, huh, there are a few more on the stanza's first and third lines. Needle and whistle up top. That's a slant rhyme. Slant feminine rhyme, in fact. Multiple syllables and close but not identical sounds. Crooked and endeavor. Mm, No rhyme there. Ladies tracing and interspersion. There is an echo there, with tracing and the last half of interspersion. We can call that a slant rhyme. Furrow, stitches. Definitely not a rhyme. And sewing, sleeping. If you just look at the ing endings, that's actually a full rhyme. If you listen to the whole words, it's still a pretty good slant rhyme. If we bring up the substitute from the bottom, sighing, that pair would then be sewing and sighing an even closer slant rhyme. Rhyme structures verse. The clearer and more exact a poem's rhymes are, the more confident it sounds. More serious, more declarative. When you start out with strong, full rhymes like Dickinson does here, and in many, many of her poems, and then shift to slant rhymes, you create a disorienting effect. You've led your reader to expect more structure, and you give her less. When you set up an expectation that lines won't rhyme, and then you put in some that do, you create the opposite effect, a sense of strengthening, of extra sureness, of resolution. And again, the stronger the rhymes, the stronger the effect. Subtler rhymes create a subtler effect. Dickinson does this with the offlines of her stanzas. Where those lines have slant rhymes, they enhance the sense of structure, strength, just subtly. Check out how these colors sort out and compare that to what's going on in each stanza. First, the speaker gives her listener a command and explains her plans to start sewing again when she's better. Extremely strong exact rhyme and a solid slant rhyme. Lots of structure. More structure in the rhyme than in my speech today. Second stanza. She complains about her work, complains about her sight going, and even says her mind's going then asserts that she's capable of doing much better. She's showing some confidence, but there's a lot of negativity too. Sound-wise, this stanza has only one rhyme, a slant rhyme. Less structure, less certainty. In the third stanza, the middle of the poem, she really gets going, describing how exquisite her needlework is, using a strong full rhyme and a nice, subtle, but definite slant rhyme. Again, more words echoing together, more structure. The fourth stanza almost repeats the first one's content. She tells the listener what to do and explains why. There's an important difference, though. At the beginning of the poem, our speaker said she'd start sewing again when the birds begin to whistle, in the spring, implying that it's just a matter of time. This time, in that fourth stanza, it's when I am strong. That's an admission that right now she's weak. And coming right after the powerful declarations about how skilled she is makes quite a retreat rhetorically. The rhyme reinforces that impression. All this stanza has is a single slant rhyme, down and strong. Just like the earliest stanza where she admitted she was sick, which only slant rhymed plain with own. The last stanza sees the speaker assert that she's going to keep dreaming about sewing even if she can't do it physically that I may not be well, but I'm not giving up either. Reflecting that middle emotional state, 
the stanza closes the poem out with two slant rhymes. It's all hanging together, not as clear and strong as a speaker might wish, but it's there. If you don't believe by now that Emily Dickinson is the coolest, holy cow, just the coolest, I don't know what to say to you. You're dead to me. Go sow something and make yourself useful. This last stanza deserves just a little more attention. It includes both the two alternatives Dickinson noted, deeming for the word dreaming and sighing for sleeping. If we use both of those, the poem would end, till then, deeming I am sowing, fetch to see my mist closer, so I at my sighing, still surmise I stitch. Considering the meanings these two words put into play, deeming describes a conscious decision, an intentional assessment, where dreaming, that's in the main body of the poem, is something that happens to us that we can't control. Sighing as an alternative is also more active and it signifies wakefulness or disturbed sleep, where sleeping is again very passive and that euphemism for death. These more active options adjacent to the poem supplement its narrative of a woman slipping into death with the possibility of that woman maintaining her agency deciding that she is in fact still sewing, whatever anyone else thinks, muttering and sighing rather than going out silently. This is why you've got to get the Variorum edition. Dickinson noted hundreds of these alternatives that were not quite the final version of the poem, but close enough that she wanted them present, adding to the picture, complicating it. I mentioned that there are multiple parallel readings running through this poem. Let's look for one. Notice Dickinson's spelling. Sew and sewing are both spelled with an O. Prior to that 1998 edition of her poems, editors had generally normalized her spelling in cases like this, of which there are many. So readers got S-E-W for both of those in this poem. The only people who knew that she'd spelled so with an O in this poem were those serious scholars who went to Harvard's archives in person to look at her manuscripts. As with her use of different types of rhyme, though, these aren't mistakes. Dickinson's writing is unconventional, but it's not sloppy. She was well-educated and well-read. She knew what she was doing. Sowing, S-O-W-I-N-G, refers to sowing seeds, to planting. And now you can take that word furrow down from its thumbtack. Literally, as I said, it's a crease in the fabric. But furrow is also the specific term for the trough you dig in soil to plant a row of seeds. That word choice confirms that sowing S-E-W-I-N-G is linked to planting in this poem. One kind of work performed inside, very strongly coded as women's work that produces heirlooms that people pass down from one generation to the next. One performed outside, traditionally more men's domain than women's, that produces food and flowers which need to be taken advantage of when they're fresh. Both important to any family of Dickinson's time. That word choice and the use of homonyms, so and so, tell us that in this poem, sewing with needle and thread is like sowing seeds. It belongs to the outdoors, to nature and open spaces, as well as to women's more private indoor spaces. But what one makes when sewing S-E-W is somehow alive, nourishing and perishable like fruits and vegetables. And think again about that peculiar phrase in the third stanza, the sightless knot. If rows of stitches are like rows of seeds, then this is a little knot of life, a seed. And it's sightless, it can't see, because it's buried in the ground. Now our speaker's claims to being an exceptional seamstress surpassing not only queens and ladies' skills, but even their perception, take on a really quirky, surreal cast. She's not just sewing incredibly fine seams, but sewing incredibly fine rows of seeds. It's a bit hallucinatory. The kind of confusion you might expect, again, from a dying old woman whose mind is going. So, while this extra layer of imagery strengthens the speaker's boldness, that comes at the cost of her mental clarity. It adds an incredibly bittersweet undercurrent. 
You can also find themes about sexuality in this poem and writing. This is arguably another poem about poetry that then reflect back in and strengthen the connections between sewing and gardening. There is just so, so much in this poem, and I haven't even dealt with her capitalization or her dashes or how her letters to friends and family, which you can read, there's a selected letters of Emily Dickinson you can buy, illuminate her poetry. We'll come back to Dickinson, for sure. For now, sow a few seeds. See what comes up, or what hangs together. If you like this dip into the work of Emily Dickinson, tell a friend. Tell 50 friends. Share a link to the show on your social media channels. You can also support me directly on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Victoria Brockmeyer for as little as $2 a month. Help pay for things like hosting this podcast and get a crack at drafts of my writing. And keep sending in your questions, comments, poem requests, and deeply slanted rhymes as an ask at the Tumblr, amateurbombmuseum.tumblr.com, or email them to me at amateur.bomb.museum at gmail.com. Next time, we'll skip across the Atlantic and see what one of Dickinson's contemporaries, Gerard Manley Hopkins, was up to at just about this same point in time. <laughs>